This afternoon, um, Dr. David Howes, who is the president of Martin's Point, is here. I, I thought it might be helpful for you to show me. It's all right with the committee. I think it might be joining me because there's, there's questions come up about you know, not necessarily the specifics of the bill, but you know, more general questions about how the edge care works. I think he's certainly an expert in the field and I thought it might be helpful and a good resource for the committee. Please so, turn back in. Thank you, Dr. So I think that it would be really useful uh, for you to just frame uh, the changes now uh, that you've made in this amendment so that we would all be on the same page and and be able to hear, uh, you know, further from Dr. I'm sorry, I'm not sure. uh, Thank you. Uh, so welcome, both of you. Thank you very much, and, and Senator Craven, Representative Farnsworth, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for inviting me back yet again uh, for another discussion with respect to this bill. And as, as you, the bill you see before you is, in fact, a, a, um, a managed care bill, which I submitted with significant amendments to it, the most obvious one being the inclusion of uh, the main care expansion language from the, the separate bill which you had before you. And perhaps it would be helpful if I just ran through the bill quickly, section by section, and give you a brief roadmap of that and tell you some additional changes that have been made within the expansion portion of the bill as well. And I thank you to be for patience. And I'm going to try to be short because I'm hardly an expert in this field. I, I find the more I learn, the less I know in some senses. And uh, we have Dr. Howes, who's here, as I said, who is a much more expert than, than I on the, the ins and outs of how good managed care works. So, so thank you again. Uh, the bill uh, starts out with a, a description, a general description of the managed care program. It talks about um, a phased in uh, of all main care populations. Uh, there's a Section 2B there that has a may in it that probably should be changed to must. We can talk more about that later. But the thought here is to that over a period of, of probably three years, that all members of main care would be enrolled in the, in the managed care program. Um, that there would have to be at least three of these managed care organizations involved. They would have to be, again, moving on to Section 3. Uh, have to be a, have to have statewide systems available. They would be chosen as a result of a, a competitive process involving, first of all, a request for information, uh, later a request for proposals, and then a selection by the department and a procurement process of three or four plans uh, after rates are negotiated between the department and the providers. At least one of those three, maximum of four, would have to be a non-for-profit. Um, like a Martin's Point or like uh, some other organizations that might be interested in getting on this. Or in theory, hospitals could even get together and decide to form a managed care organization for the purposes of, of, of bidding on this. Um, it talks about the kinds of quality factors the department would have to consider in the selection of these companies, which include a national accreditation, previous experience in serving these populations, and uh, critically, the availability and accessibility of primary and specialty care physicians in, in their network. Uh, these would result in, in signed contracts with the, with the providers. And there's the, the bill goes on to talk at some length about accountability of these plans. And again, many of these details were, were worked out after, after listening to testimony before this committee and talking further with such diverse organizations as the Maine Hospital Association, the Maine Medical Association, AARP, Martin's Point, the main primary care association, all of whom uh, I thought had extremely valuable income or, uh, input on how can we make sure that these companies are going to do this in the, in the right way. So there's a, quite a bit of detail there about plan accountability. And one thing I would like to, to specifically point out is in B1 on page 3, is that the, the directive that the managed care particip plans participate in and coordinate with the, de the departmental efforts that are already go going on in health care payment reform, including value-based purchasing, quality improvement, 
um, the, the SIMS grant work that has started, um, the um, participation in the main primary care medical home initiative and the rest, for a couple of reasons. One, it, it's important to, to build on the good work that the department has already started. And secondly, and frankly, in talking with these companies, they couldn't be happier that some of this work has already been done. They feel it will make their work easier. And, and building on top of that will be, will be helpful and, and important. Uh, there are rules which make sure that, like any other, quote, insurance company, that there is not uh, too much profit in, in, the, in the system. Um, there are directives to, to meet, to establish and enforce these companies to meet uh, access standards that are specific, that are population-based, and that there is good regional distribution. Again, many of these details get worked out in the stakeholder process, as I understand it, but the statute could not be clearer that these access standards must be must be respected. Talking about a, a website that each will have to set up to make uh, important information available to potential participants. I talk about it, the establishment of an account or data system to collect and report back to the department on s some of the healthcare <coughs> improvement issues and the, uh, the uh, utilization issues that all of us find so important. Um, so so there's, there's a fair amount of language in here uh, guaranteeing that kind of a, of a, of a process. There's also language which, which talks about the establishment of a, of a grievance procedure uh, so that if, if members think that they are being unfairly denied access to care in their area or outside of their area, that there's a procedure for the handling of both oral and written <coughs> grievances, <coughs> excuse me, an appeal process which results finally in the, in the commissioner being able to make a final determination that it has to go that far. And later we'll talk about the ombudsman part of this program too. Again, all things meant to guarantee that, that managed care companies are going to be, I can use that, that Wizard of Oz analogy again, there are good witches and there are bad witches, there are good managed plans and bad ones to make sure that these are good managed plans. Um, continuing on, there are prompt payment requirements to make sure that the providers are being paid on a timely basis. And again, uh, a, a talking about accountability, a requirements that the plans adopt quality standards that uh, include in population improvement goals, improved health outcomes, improvements in early screening, diagnosis, and, and, and the rest of it. And again, will be developed in more detail in the stakeholder process. Um, they're moving on, there there are talking about financial consequences to the companies if they do not perform. Uh, there's there's talk here of uh, there's a requirement of a performance bond. There will be a requirement that they have to post the performance bond and, and uh, or similar guarantees uh, and a, a clear indication that these companies will be subject to the um, supervision of the Bureau of Insurance. Um, a, a provision that says that all communications with enrollees are going to be written in language that we can all understand, uh, not fancy insurance or legalese, but uh, sixth grade language so that no one will can say they so that most people will be able to clearly understand uh, what their rights are here. Um, the payments to the managed care plans will again be, as we've just discussed before, capitated rate, so much per person per month uh, to be negotiated with the department. And, and again, critical to the entire system, these are at-risk contracts so that if the providers, if the managed care organizations end up losing money here because they, they, they end up providing more service than the money they're being paid, guess who bears the, the risk? It's not the state of Maine. Finally, it is uh, these, these companies that are agreeing to be at risk for any overruns. Um, there's a section that talks about a, a guarantee that once fully implemented, and it takes, we'll talk about it takes a while to get this implemented, but once fully implemented, we will know, because very smart people who are actuaries will be able to tell us that the amount of money we're spending is at least 5% less than what we would have been spending at, in the absence of, of managed care. And that's important for obvious reasons. I think not only do we want budget predictability in this, in this program, which we have never had under any administration, but secondly, we can talk about actually bending the curve and actually saving some money. Um, there's talk here about how members will, will have the ability to choose between plans, how there will be choice counseling available, similar, I think, to the kind of, of provisions in the Accountable uh, Care Act, Affordable Care Act, excuse me, for to help people choose the plan they want to be in. There are provisions in here for how they can switch plans every year during an open enrollment period. period. 
so that the, the good plans, the ones which are providing great service, are going to attract more people over time, and the ones that are providing lower service won't. Um, and there's, uh, there's choice built into the system and provisions where people do not choose any plan that they will be uh, assigned to one. Uh, there is a description of the ombudsman program here, which will be internally funded with the, the money these companies will be being paid. And then, then we get into talking about rule, rule making. And again, how can we make sure that this statute, which is long enough as it is, is but it's going to result in a contract, which is going to be hundreds of pages of law, which is, which is going to accomplish what we're looking to do here. It's lower cost, it's cost predictability, and it's better health outcomes. It's all three of those things. And how, how are we going to make sure that the RFP and the eventual contracts do those things? And the, the way that's going to work under this bill is that there will be a stakeholder group established. And if you wa want to know who's in the stakeholder group, the answer is everyone who has any kind of knowledge or interest in this subject. It was intended to be inclusive, not exclusive. And if you think back to, to the previous effort that was underway a few years ago, it really builds on what Tony Markle was talking about in, in terms of the composition of that stakeholder group. Um, the law directs the department to establish the stakeholder group by August 1st, and then there's, there's timelines going out for a re issuance of requests for information from prospective companies to, to gauge the level of interest <coughs> out there. I think it's safe to say, based upon discussions we've already had and the fact that this bill's been kicking around for a year, there is significant interest in the, both in the for-profit and the non-for-profit community in responding to an RFP. Um, by the, again, talking about reporting back to, to this committee on the status, how things are going, and then getting into rulemaking after the stakeholder committee uh, re reports back, getting into rulemaking within the department, and there's a, a system set out there um, and a schedule set out there so that the, the RFP will go out having been informed by the stakeholder group and the rulemaking, which has to be approved by, by this committee and by the full legislature since it's substantive rulemaking. And then once the RFP is out, once the contracts are awarded, uh, within six months actual Im implementation of the, um, of the plan. The, the next um, section of the bill, and I, I won't go into the expansion part specifically because I know you've already dealt with those and they are in the bill which is previously before you, but let me point out a few things which were added to the expansion portion of the bill which were, were part of, of our uh, amendments. Um, first of all, if you'll look to page, I, I believe it's 13 of the bill, at section C2, it talks about a, a health insurance marketplace report. We're, we're tasking the OFPR to, to track with a nonpartisan research group to at least look at what the other states are doing. There are some creative things going out there, on out there in Iowa, in New Hampshire, in, in Arkansas, and other places. Do those kinds of systems make sense for Maine more than just a strict expansion? We don't know the answer to those questions because they're complicated questions to answer, require a lot of uh, actuarial analysis. But we ought to know as a legislature if maybe we should be shifting our focus. And this requires a report back by early 2015 with respect to that. And then it, it further tasks this research organization, which will be selected by OFDR, uh, to, to report back <coughs> toward the end of the of the three-year 100% period. Of course, we're already in it. It started January 1. But to report back to us soon enough so that a new legislature, which is considering whether or not to reauthorize and continue with, with the expansion, will have the basis of some real good data on, you know, how, how has this saved us money? How, how has this cost us money? And what difference, if any, have there been in health outcomes? And um, th that's, I think, an important thing to build, to build into the bill that's there. Um, on page 14 in Part E, um, again, there's a, a, hard, a, a hard sunset in three years in this bill that unless we authorize, this program will end. And people who, who are getting enrolled on this program ought to know that. And this part just basically says that everyone who is, who is now going to be a new participant to expansion will get a written notice saying, you're on board, but be advised that this program is authorized for three years. Unless it's reauthorized, your, your, your participation will end in three years. 
And also, while we're bothering to send out a letter, let's also tell them that they're required to go to see a primary care physician as soon as possible, because we all know the, the importance of that. Um, part F is, is, is something which I also suggest is, is important and we should all be interested in. It sets up a legislative task force to, to try to identify um, ways in which the, the current um, program off and creates disincentives for members to increase hours of employment or earnings and make recommendations to eliminate barriers and, and propose new policies that will support and promote stable and lasting employment. In other words, how can we figure out what disincentives there are to people getting off these programs and build incentives for people to get off these programs, obviously consistent with the, the federal laws which sometimes constrain us. But we ought to be looking at this and this specifically uh, directs us, us to do it. Um, the the, section, the uh, bill goes on in Part G to talk at some length about programs for adults with intellectual disabilities. The, the most needy of, of any of these populations and also in many cases the most expensive of any of these populations. We are, uh, we are costing ourselves about $70,000 per person per year to, to, to take care of this population. Apples for apples, the national average is about $42,000 a year. I'm talking about states which are, are also deinstitutionalized. And so we really are talking apples to apples. There have already been a number of directives which have come out of this, this committee, I believe, which the department is beginning to work on about how we're to lower those costs. There are other ways to lower those costs that have recently been made by the, the Medicaid Redesign Task Force. And it, it's amazing. I think the amount of, of agreement that we can provide even equal or better care for these folks, but just not cost us as much money. One a simple example, some of these folks are in, in two-person homes. They could be in three-person or four-person homes if we just changed the rules to allow for more video monitoring. So if that's particular staff people could be watching more people at one time. Far from an expert in this, but there's no reason we should need to be so far above the national average. And let's take those savings, which, which, which are there, I would suggest to you. <coughs> let's take those savings and let's finally pay off and pay down that waiting list, a, a, a situation that we should all be very unhappy about. Everybody agrees we need to get these people off the waiting list, yet the money just isn't there. This is at least a, a suggestion and a pathway of how to get there. Take these savings and, and pay down that wait list and give these people the services that they, that they deserve. Um, and, and that's in, the, in this section of, of the bill as well. Section H, which is on page 17, um, <coughs> directs the, the, the appointment of two additional fraud investigators within the Attorney General's office to catch and prosecute fraud both consumer-based and provider-based. So those are, uh, I think, the, the additions to, to the bill. And I, and I can just sum up, and, and I would be glad to answer any questions, but I hope you'll take advantage of the wonderful resource we have here in Dr. House. But you know, this department has done its very, very best. I think maybe Dr. House may compete for this honor, but with the exception of him, Mary May is probably the brightest person in this room. <coughs> and, and she is a wonderful commissioner. But this department and the previous administration's department and the previous administration's department, nobody has been able to manage this system well. <coughs> You've all been here, some of you, longer than I have. It's a string of problems. S cost overruns after cost overruns after cost overruns. Supplemental budget after supplemental budget. It's an equal opportunity problem. Republican administrations, <laughs> Democrat administrations, <laughs> administrations. We are headed toward the cliff in this bus. And those who criticize the system saying it's taking up a larger and larger portion of our state budget, they are right. And it's interfering with our ability to be able to fund other things. Forget about the expansion. <laughs> we ought to be focusing on, on uh, a change in paradigm about how this, this department and how this program within the department is managed. This gives us an amazing opportunity to take a look and take the best of what 45 other states are doing with at least a portion of their Medicaid populations, and that is put them in, into a, a good system of managed care. O over about 56% of people nationally 
in Medicaid or under some kind of managed care. <coughs> some places do it well, some do it poorly, and that's our advantage. There have been 45 <coughs> test, uh, pilot projects out there that we can learn from, and we can take from the good, and we can leave the bad. And if we miss this opportunity, and I know that there are good arguments for expansion, and, and many of them I agree with, but if we miss this opportunity to, to face an equally large or larger problem, mm -hmm. and that is how to finally bring this program under control, we will have missed a, a remarkable opportunity, and I hope we won't do so. So thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. I, I welcome any questions, but I, I really would hope you take advantage of Dr. Howe's presence. Thank you, Mr. Case. Do, does, do you have a presentation, Dr. Howe, or are you just open for questions? I, uh, I'd say a few words, but I'm primarily open for questions. Uh, 